Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This episode is called Punching Above His Weight. It's written by Stuff National Correspondent Steve Kilgallen, who joins me now by phone. Hi, Steve. Hi, Michael. Happy New Year. And to you. Uh, third time back, I think it is, for you on TLR. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it's, it's good to be on again. Congratulations. <laughs> um, punching Above His Weight. This is, I think, the first profile we featured on The Long Read. Uh, tell us about your subject. Yeah, so it's about a guy called Dave Latelli who... If you've heard of him, it will probably be under his um, sobriquet, the brown butter bean. So for several years, from about 2014 to about two years ago, he used, he fought on the undercard of Joseph Parker's professional boxing bouts in New Zealand and sometimes overseas as a sort of a comedy a comedy act, really. Um, the promoters, Duco Events, had a history of comedy fights, I guess. They'd put on bouts between uh, small people and... B-list celebrities and the fight for life, which I myself once did. And he sort of became the successor to that. He was, um, at the time, a, a hugely overweight 300 kilo um, former gang member who um, would showboat and provoke people and get into scuffles at the pre-match press conference and say he'd fight anybody and was sort of really um, disliked by the boxing community and by a lot, a lot of Samoan people who felt that he was bring a bit of shame on on his people but um the truth was that he was not at all the character he was portraying and that's kind of what i've got into in the story is is what's happened to him since he gave up boxing uh because he's really had a remarkable he's lived a remarkable life he's probably lived four lives in one but the life he's living right now is is really impressive and i think he's um uh, as jeremy wells would say great new zealander uh, without getting too far into it um tell us a bit about his transformation, where he is now and, and what he's doing. Yeah, I, I, so I was vaguely aware that, of what he was up to, but it only, only came into focus for me when I talked to him for a profile piece I was doing on an Auckland publican called Leo Malloy, who's quite notorious in our part of the world. And Dave had done some stuff with him where Leo had been um, donating food to, to a project Dave was running. And I spoke to him, and I was really struck by the difference between the Dave that I spoke to on the phone and the the character I'd seen on TV and through boxing. And I was really interested to sort of go further with it. And his close friend, David Higgins, the boxing promoter, said, he's a good story. There's a lot more to him than meets the eye. Um, so these days he's running an organisation called Butterbean Motivation in South and West Auckland, which runs a food bank, um, some community gyms, a community kitchen, uh, an at-risk youth programme, a classroom... Uh, a whole heap of other stuff, really. So he's just this ever-growing um, force for good in South Auckland uh, um, of social enterprise, really. Um, but the path that has led him there is really what I get into in the story. And, and he, he, yeah, without giving too much away, he's, he's been up and he's been down and he's in between and um, he's quite open about where his life's led him. And, and along the way, he's lost all that weight. So he was 300 kilos, now he's 100 and trains twice a day and lives quite a ascetic lifestyle compared to the drinking and drugs and crime that was the position he was in 10 years ago. All right, thanks Steve. Let's get into it. Here, with a bit of strong language, is me reading Steve's story, Punching Above His Weight. I don't change, considers Dave Latelli, but I can be in a boardroom or I can be at a gang funeral. I can be in both worlds. And we've got credibility in both. Businessman to gangster, accountant to footy star, boxer to Samaritan. At just 42, Dave Latelli has lived many lives. But it's all contributed to where he is now, he reckons. A relentless, remarkable force for good, whose charitable empire runs to a food bank, two community gyms, a community kitchen, a classroom, mobile vaccination drives, a training app, and health and fitness classes for everyone from at-risk youth to overweight elders. The pivotal moment 
which sent Latelli down the right path when he could have stayed down the wrong one was most likely in February 2014 when his former Selwyn College classmate, sports promoter David Higgins, decided to have a small school reunion at the inaugural NRL Nines event he was promoting at Eden Park. Higgins found Latelli living in country Australia at his lowest ebb. No passport, no money, and so out of shape, he couldn't fit into an economy class aeroplane seat. A disbelieving Higgins sent money for emergency papers and a business class ticket. He picked me up and said, fuck, recalls Latelli. He didn't realise how fat I'd got, how bad the condition I was in. He'd got a new Audi, and he was worried I'd break his car. But he soon realised it wasn't just physical, it was mental. Latelli, who does self-deprecating well, talks about taking copious quantities of drugs in the toilets and refusing to leave the air conditioning of the executive suite because he was so unfit. That night... As he walked drunkenly around the after-party with a bottle of wine in his fist, Higgins accosted him. If he went back to Australia, he would end up dead or in jail. But if Latelli came home, Higgins would organise everything. Five years later, Dave Latelli would walk down the tunnel at that same stadium to lead the world's biggest boot camp a record-breaking exercise class for 2,000 people. A blown-up photo of that day is pasted to his office wall, a constant reminder of both Nadir and Zenith. He ticked every box to go down the wrong path, but he didn't, says Higgins. He really is a walking miracle, and that's because of his massive strength of character. Yes, I've helped him, but he's not only helped himself, he's inspired thousands of others and paid it forward. He ended up with a cult following of people marginalised or forgotten. Right now, there are numerous people who can say he saved their lives. He's having a massive impact and making a difference in the world. When Dave Latelli was five years old, his father David president of the Auckland Mungrel Mob, was sentenced to 10 years prison for armed robbery. All I remember now, Latelli says, is panic. Mum coming home, panicked, cursing and scared. It just brings back so much sadness. Latelli's father was made a state ward at nine after burning down part of his primary school and his mother had been an abused street kid. But his grandparents were strict Seventh-day Adventists, and while David Sr. and another brother, Lay, turned to crime, a third brother, Ian, became a high-flying businessman, chief executive of DFS and then restaurant brands. Latelli's family even briefly lived in Ian's Paraitai Drive mansion. He was, he says, mainly insulated from the gang life. And while his father was in jail, Latelli and his sister, Vicky, were sent to live with their grandparents in Australia. We didn't come from generations of fucked upness, Latelli says. But some of the people we see, it would be a miracle if they make it out. A miracle. We try to be that hope. At least they can see this guy has come from what they've come from. And it is possible. Don't let where you've come from, or the colour of your skin, or where your parents are from, be an excuse. Use it as fuel. But it is hard, bro. It's fucking hard. Latelli's father and uncle later reformed and established the Grace Foundation, a charity working with the marginalised including former prisoners. But by then, they had hugely shaped Latelli's future. Asked about his father, Latelli says, The relationship is not as strong as it could be. We've got a lot of unresolved stuff.
Latelli came back to New Zealand when he was 11. At Selwyn College, he captained the school's champion league team and played for New Zealand schools. But he wasn't really a jock, recalls Higgins. He was a bit of a geek. He didn't have time to hang around with the dickheads. He was a really friendly, lovely guy, but serious about school and leadership. Latelli initially followed Uncle Ian's path, studying accountancy at Auckland University. Then, when he was 21, his father was convicted again, this time for commercial cultivation of marijuana. The big difference, Latelli says, was I fully understood the repercussions. And now, Latelli modelled himself on Uncle Lay, even copying his tattoos. Lay was serving nine years for an armed hold-up of a security van. Latelli recalls as a teenager visiting him on family days at Paremoremo, where guards and other families would press wads of cash on him. Then he tells me about the warehouse where his father stashed taxed classic cars and where a cousin died by suicide. Everything is fucking warped, he says. And you think it's okay. You think it's normal. Latelli quit university and work, moved into a Mangari tinny house, and became, by his own account, a fairly unsuccessful drug dealer and standover man, while drinking, taking drugs, and fighting on weekends, and watching his weight balloon. After one party and another brawl, he stabbed himself in the chest with a steak knife. His father arrived in hospital, accompanied by two prison guards. Latelli refused to see him. Ian Latelli shifted Dave to Australia again, where a year working as a roofer got him fit and reignited a teenage dream of being an NRL player, which had founded when he suffered a catastrophic knee injury. He played in the national competition for Manorewa, was picked for New Zealand A, and picked up contracts with the North Sydney Bears, A.S. Carcassonne in France, and had a pre-season with Manly, as well as several seasons with a bush team, Kutamundra Bulldogs, in country New South Wales. It came with a day job as a supermarket storeman. Latelli rose from storeman to accountant to floor manager to store manager to owner. You'd think that's the happy ending, he says wryly. Instead, Latelli overstretched to a second store, which went bust. He pauses. I don't like talking about it much because I fucked it up badly. I really fucked it up. I let people down. He doesn't go into detail, but descending back into a life of crime cost him his relationship with the mother of his three eldest boys, which was, he says, entirely my fault. It was about then that David Higgins fortuitously re-entered his life. Redemption was not immediate. The road back began on a mattress in a sleepout at a community home in Clendon, South Auckland. A worried Higgins barely left Latelli alone. Two months after the Eden Park epiphany, Higgins, who manages the professional boxer Joseph Parker, was due at a Parker fight in Germany. He offered to take Latelli along, but he wasn't paying for business class again. Latelli began walking twice a day, dieting, and dropped enough weight to make the flight an economy. He still stood out. At the pre-fight weigh-in, the organisers called Latelli to the stage. They'd never seen a fucking large islander with a shaved head, tattoos, he says. They wanted to see what I weighed. They dragged me through the crowd like an elephant by the trunk. I wanted to know what I weighed. I always got on the scale and I got error. I was 178 kilograms. Everyone was shocked at how fat I was, but I was so happy. 
I knew I had been well over 200 kilograms. So I started going, fuck yeah, I'm the toughest man in the world. I can beat anyone. And Dave went, that's what you're going to do. You're the next circus act. They'd had celebrities, they'd had dwarves. I was the next dwarf. And so was born the brown butterbean. The name came from Higgins' twin brother, Andrew, who drew a mocking comparison to the novelty American boxer, Eric Butterbean Esch. Butterbean was a comic book heel, a crowd-baiting, dirty-fighting, sneering rogue who filled the spot on the undercard of Higgins' boxing promotions, previously occupied by B-listers and, yes, on occasion, little people. It was a character born of necessity. The fight purses kept the telly afloat and his child support payments fulfilled. And he knew that meant courting notoriety. Butterbean does whatever he wants, says whatever he wants, only talks about himself in the third person, the telly says. So I played that in and out of the ring. I understood Joseph Parker was the main event. The rest of us didn't matter. And the only way to get on the news was to do something stupid. When he was due to fight retired rugby player Finau Marker, he talked Marker into an on-stage scuffle at the pre-fight press conference. His instructions were that once they began to wrestle, if nobody intervened, Marker was to start punching. It took a while for Kevin Barry, Parker's trainer, to come over, Latelli says. So Marker's on top and I'm going, punch me, fucking punch me. You've got to sell it, you know? Higgins insists. We didn't push him to play it. He owned it. The boxing establishment hated the butterbean. But Latelli was rapidly dropping weight and learning the rudiments. The messages of hate became peppered with inquiries from those who wanted to know the secret to his weight loss. And Latelli began posting videos of his weight loss journey. Phil Talia was in both camps. He watched the fights. He was a hater. He wanted the big fat guy who wanted to beat up the whole world to get knocked out. But then he also began watching the videos. And then, with his own weight touching 295 kilograms, he was hospitalized. He messaged Latelli, who replied immediately, inviting Talia to a boot camp. It didn't matter what size you were, Talia says. Everyone trained together. Everyone encouraged each other. And I realized straight away, this was where I wanted to start my journey. If you'd asked me where I'd be now, four years ago, I'd say staying at home, locking myself away from the world. I didn't want to be seen. Instead, today, Talia is taking a turn on the forklift. 150 kilograms lighter, he's Latilly's delivery driver, warehouseman, and general devoted offsider. I call him a true brother, he says. I've got his back, and he's got mine. Hi, I'm Carol Hirschfeld, the head of video and audio at Stuff. If you're enjoying our Long Reads podcast, how about contributing to the Stuff Supporter Program? You can contribute any amount you choose, and you can do it just once, or monthly, or annually. Direct support from people like you helps us produce the kind of journalism you're listening to right now. Go to stuff.co.nz forward slash support. These days, it frustrates Latelli, who gave the sport away in 2017, to be called a boxer. He's also annoyed that the New Zealander of the Year Awards, in which he's been shortlisted as Local Hero of the Year for a second time, calls him merely the founder of a gym base weight loss program. 
Letelli's personal journey, in which he dropped over a hundred kilograms, translated first into a Facebook group of 5,000 followers, and then, under the Butterbean Motivation brand, into a vital community service provider in South and West Auckland. We meet at his food bank in Weddy, where Letelli has signed a three-year lease on a commercial unit and has floor-to-ceiling shelves stacked with food. Each staff member is warmly introduced. Letelli tells me the stories of some. Reformed meth addict, turned her life around, and so forth. I want people to have been through the struggle, he says, because they get it. It's just before Christmas, and he's deep in the planning of an ambitious drive-through Christmas for families in need. A boot full of groceries and presents, Santa, ice cream, coffee, milkshakes, 40 families an hour. He'd already raised $90,000 to cover it. I go into these homes, there's fucking nothing, he says. They're going to have nothing. So... What's Christmas like for them? It's going to be shit. They just want to give their kids something. It's a whirlwind morning. He has, he tells me, accidentally booked four meetings simultaneously. But there's no sign of a diary. He takes a call from another stuff journalist to talk about Pacific Healthcare. Then one from a funding agency where he expertly and gently extracts a $5,000 donation. He takes a selfie with a corporate dropping off Christmas gifts, talks to two blokes from Manurewa Marae doing a drop-off, fields messages from the desperate. Throughout, he's honest and direct. He shows me BBM's food parcels, then a photo of another, far inferior one from another organisation. A disgrace he says. Then he fires up about the distribution of KFC as an inducement to be vaccinated. His phone sounds off constantly, although by far the busiest channel is his social media accounts. He shows me his messenger inbox. It's full of long, heartfelt, heartbreaking notes from women desperately seeking help for their families. He reads one to me. I never ask for help. I've not been able to provide for my kids this Christmas. I can't bear to see my kids go without Christmas. Please, I'm in need of your help. He talks about how COVID has worsened the plight of the working poor, who earn just above the threshold for any state entitlements. He tells me about one delivery where he met a woman so deep in despair, she went to bed every night, hoping she wouldn't wake up. He carries a huge burden. It's worse for my family, he says. They miss out. By the time I get home, I fucking had it. I've given everything. His work personality is effervescent. You've got to be up. Got to be up. It's not the real me. You wouldn't ever think of it. I'm naturally a very shy person. If I go out, I'm the one standing in the corner. I hate it, but I have to do it. The difference between the character he professes and the one he projects is striking. He answers every question, but some are clearly painful. And I'm struck with a guilt that by asking for purient slices of his past, I'm just the same as that baying mob in Germany as he sweated onto the scales. He wanted to do this story, and is willing to transact his own life story into publicity, because he understands the BBM movement functions because of its figurehead. He's good at leading people, says Higgins. He likes it, and he means well. I think he'd be a very good political leader. He's more charismatic than some of the bunch we've got in Wellington right now. But it comes at a personal cost. 
He looks as if he never gets hurt, says Rob Campbell, Latelli's best mate. But he gets hurt quite a lot. He's incredibly soft. A lot of people lean on Dave a lot. He does carry around a huge responsibility. It's a sober life now. Latelli no longer drinks or takes drugs and doesn't go out on an evening, but home to his wife, Corinne, whom he met ringside in 2014 and who he describes as his anchor and, along with his four children, his reason to be happy. Last week, Latelli says he was in bed before it was dark outside. His children are all achieving academically. They'll never have to see life the way I saw it, he says. Instead of the nightlife, he's up early, training at 6am and 8am each day. His main friendship group is a bunch of corporate types who do a pre-dawn boot camp with him near his West Auckland home. A group which includes Campbell, chairman of Sky City. To anyone outside, says Campbell, we don't look alike. But actually, we have some things in common which are important. Those include, he says, struggles with depression, a shared view on what's fair, and a direct style of communication. There's also a shared belief that BBM can expand and scale up parts of its operation nationwide. They've just collected $500,000 from the Ministry of Health for longer-term funding of their programs. Having seen the bluster of his boxing career, Latelli was not the man I was expecting. He's intelligent, introspective, considered, compassionate. Some people do say when they first meet me, Oh, I thought you were an arsehole. You're so far from that person. And his is a complex, complicated life to distill into 3,000 words. Interesting story, eh? Latelli says, midway through our conversation. It is a roller coaster. So many times when you think it would be the happy ending. But I think this is the happy ending. Now. That was Punching Above His Weight on The Long Read From Stuff, written by Steve Kilgallen and read and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Jack Price. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.